Let's get into brewing teas. Now, this is an area, like I mentioned, but the people are split upon, right? Yeah. So uh, you've got different teas, first off. You know, you've got everything from nutrient teas, manure teas. You've got teas that focus on increasing the microbiology. But you have folks that brew the teas and say it's great, successful. It's very beneficial. But you've got other, there's one scientist in particular, I can't remember her name, but she had mentioned they're completely pointless. Nobody should be brewing teas. Adding compost and then watering in that compost is just as beneficial. What's your take on brewing teas? Yeah, no, it's definitely a hot topic. I think um, folks are not going to be surprised that my my concept of of tea application. I think I think first off, I think there there needs to be a, an important distinction that needs to be made uh, between um, what's commonly referred to as a tea and what should be. Uh, uh, classified as an extract. And so I'll st- what the, an extract is just basically simply what the name states it is. You're basically just extracting biology from a medium, whether it's vermicompost or, or thermophilic compost. You know, you're, you're putting um, some of your high quality biocomplete compost that has all the protozoa and protozoa and necessary fungi and bacteria in there and it's all attached basically glued and stuck to the organic matter in your compost you put that into like a 220 bag or paint bag or whatever your uh, your um your bubble bag reused old bubble bag 220 thing and we would use that to dunk the just dunk gently dunk the uh compost in and out of kind of room temperature water and slowly agitating and knocking off the the biology from the organic matter and then suspending it into the liquid matrix right so now you've got you've got this liquid that's just full of floating biology and um, that's a really great way to introduce concentrated biology because you could use three or four cups dunk it into a five gallon bucket for a minute or 90 seconds or two minutes and then get another one, a fresh load. It's like putting two tea bags of Earl Grey in your morning tea. You're going to get a, st- a stiff cup of tea um, you, or a stiff extract, we should say. <laughs> so, you know, by doing that, you could really con- kind of control the, the, the concentration of biology in whatever you're, you know, whatever you're suspending and the water you're suspending it in. And so what the benefit of that is is that when you water that in, it it really travels with the water, penetrates deep into the root zone where you really want that biology to reside. Um, very few variables, c- considering your compost was properly made, you've properly analyzed it, you know you don't have bad guys in there, it's not anaerobic or any of those other things, and you're not basically just adding concentrated anaerobes to your system. Assuming that all of those factors have been met and you've got a really great stellar product you're just going to be adding those concentrated microbes directly to the root zone where they belong and that's the safest way with the fewest variables to introduce biology into your system now a tea what people call tea some people would call the extract a tea i think we should get away from that i think we should we should call an extract an extract And we should call anything that we actively brew, anything that we're brewing for four hours, 12 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours, there's all kinds of recipes. And this is, I think, where some people have issue. And and I'll say that there is a time and place for a brewed compost tea. And I think that, and this is what I learned taking Dr. Elaine's course. I don't want to sound like a one trick pony or just tooting one horn the whole time, but it, it she really like lays things out in, in, a, in a great way. When you brew a tea, usually you're adding a food source, it's highly oxygenated. And so what's happening is when you add a food source and lots of oxygen, that biology is gonna multiply and it's going to breed. I think biology, bi- uh, bacterial colonies, they double every 20 minutes. So there's an exponential growth rate that takes place when you're when you're brewing a tea and and 
it's this process that if you do it right, you can leverage it in your favor. If you don't do it right, you can be doing nothing at all, or you could actually be causing harm to your system, compounding harm to your system over time. And I'll, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain I'll, um, a little better. So an extract, great for the root zone. The, 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 the biology is just suspended in the water, flows down with the water, colonizes the root zone, gets back onto organic matter in the soil, starts doing its business. Let's say you brew a tea. That doubling, that multiplication process, the biology just getting busy in there, doing their thing, creates a very sticky, glomulin, kind of gluey type substance. And you can use that to your benefit by only applying that as a foliar. Because now what happens is you've got all of that biology encased in a slimy, sticky glue. And when you spray it onto the surface of a plant or onto the, onto the, the trunk of a plant, that water is carrying that sticky substance. Boom, it slaps onto the leaf. And then the water falls off and leaves the biology behind on the surface of the leaf. And so now you've got active biology ready to populate the entire surface of your plant and literally create a castle wall, a microscopic wall of biology that covers all of your plant. So when outside spores land on the plant and try to hook in and do its thing, there's, there's nowhere for it to go. It's literally landing on something else, right? That's landing on that biological film that's taking place. If you inversely, if you take that sticky, gluey tea substance and you try to water it into the soil, it's all gonna get stuck at the top layer of your soil and it's not gonna penetrate down deep. So taking an actively brewed tea and applying it to your root zone, I don't know if it's been quantified, you know, like how much is not making it down to the bottom, but the vast majority of it's going to get trapped at that upper layer. And that upper layer is the most volatile. That upper layer is the layer that dries out first. And when it dries out, the biology dies, the amoeba go into testate form, and then eventually they die if the moisture doesn't get back up. Back up. So you're really, you've taken all this time to create a tea and what you're trying to accomplish is being reduced by 80% or even if it's 30%, reduction in what's being delivered to the system, you kind of have to like weigh things out and be like, is this even worth it? So if you can think of teas as a foliar application and extracts as a root zone application, you're going to eliminate a lot of variables that could lend itself to undesirable results or just kind of results that are meh, you know? So I think if you follow those two rules, you'll be really, you'll be fine. Now, with the brewing aspect of it, if you're brewing a tea without the aid of, of microscopy, you're really just rolling the dice. Um, what happens is when you've got biology in there and they're reproducing at this exponential rate, they will eventually, and in very short order, use up all of the available oxygen. It doesn't matter how big of an air pump you've got pumping into your 200 gallons of water or whatever, you'll eventually reach a tipping point of, bio, of, of biological population that they simply have used all the oxygen available. You, you can't add enough oxygen when it reaches a certain point. Now, at that point, you have an anaerobic brew and all of that good biology that you had bloomed or grew over 12 hours or 24 hours is now starting to die because there's not enough oxygen and they're being replaced by anaerobes. There's this window when this is happening that you're not going to be able to tell with your olfactory senses that you've gone anaerobic. Now, obviously, you let it go long enough, it's going to smell like sewage. You're going to be like, yeah, I'm anaerobic. But there's going to be a period where it's going to smell earthy. It's going to smell okay. You're going to be like, oh, man, I can drink this. You know, <laughs> like, this is great. But it's not great because now you've started, you, because oxygen has been depleted, now you've got now you've created an environment where anaerobes thrive. And that's where all your harmful pathogenic things uh, reside. So I understand where people are like, don't, don't brew, you know, don't brew teas because, you, you know, 
once again, if you're not visually seeing what's happening in there, you are literally rolling the dice. If your source material was full of anaerobes and you're and that's what you're using, and you're just breeding more anaerobes, like you really could be causing yourself more problems in your system or just not doing anything at all and just wasting time and money, which time is the most precious thing that I have. And uh, I hate wasting it. And so um, I basically stick to straight extracts. I don't even really do teas for foliar applications. I've just really never felt that necessary. Now, if I had an orchard and um, there was all kinds of uh, fungal threats to my orchard and, uh, and regular foliar applications made more sense, then I'd be doing that. But the, the kind of crops that, I've, that I'm involved with just, just don't have that kind of pressure. So I'm more uh, concerned with making sure that my soil, soil is healthy and the soil biology is active. And then whatever foliars I do are strictly for uh, nutrient or exudate enrichment uh, tactics or strategies. This clip is brought to you by AC Infinity. Use discount code Mr. Grow at 15 to save on any of their products. Thank you.